Hey guys, it's me again, and I want to make this video on Stephen Anderson's reprobate doctrine and refuting it. And actually, this is kind of like part one because he did two specific sermons, at least that I know of, that he taught the subject. And the other one, he goes over different verses and different arguments. So I'd like to do both of them. But this one is his most recent one. It was sometime in 2017, I'm pretty sure. It was called What is a Reprobate? And this video is probably going to be kind of long, even though I'm going to try to go through things quickly. If you don't want to listen to you know, a 45 minute hour long video or whatever, come to kjvforum.com, find the search, and type in Stephen Anderson, and you should be able to find this page, Stephen Anderson Reprobate Doctrine. And so, this isn't perfect, but I've been going over this for a while now, and I just I want to make this video, and if I have to come back and change things in the future, you know, I can add more or whatever. First of all, the main thing really is that, uh, well, this teaching is, Stephen Anderson says that uh, when people reject God so much, it gets to the point where God rejects them, and then they can no longer be saved, they can't repent, they can't believe, and then they uh, become homosexuals and um, things like that. You know, mostly he talks about homosexuality. So uh, he says homosexuals are people who have gone to this point where they can no longer be saved, and that's why they are homosexuals. It's really bizarre. I've never heard anybody else teach this. Um, so I think a lot of people who are saved and have studied the Bible for a while know that this isn't true. You know, anybody can repent and believe. Uh, you know, there are individuals who have a very hard heart, and, you know, it gets to a point where giving them the gospel and stuff, we just need to dust off our feet and go to other people, but that doesn't mean that we can't pray for them, it doesn't mean that miraculously that, that, that they won't turn to God, you know, something will happen in their life, you know, we know the thief on the cross was saved, you know, right before he was put to death, um, so there's nothing in the Bible that, that, that teaches anything like Stephen Anderson teaches, so of course he twists many verses and it's really interesting, the stuff that I learned in this video. Um, you know, how far he goes to twist things, and uh, just what some of these verses really mean, I didn't really fully understand them until I looked into them deeper. So, anyway. Let's see. So, he starts off basically with reprobate always means rejected. The word reprobate means rejected. And so this is really the beginning and end of Anderson's argument. He thinks that the definition of the word reprobate being rejected is the nail in the coffin to any naysayers who would say that his doctrine is false without taking into account that it could be used figuratively or in a temporal sense or in any other way. He says that when a person is declared a reprobate, it always means they have been totally rejected by the Lord with no chance of repentance or salvation. And so I say that the word reprobate in the English language is often applied to precious metals or money, and it is also applied to persons. <coughs> in Webster's 1828 primary definition of reprobate is not enduring proof or trial, not of standard purity or fineness, disallowed, rejected. Okay, so there's where Stephen Anderson gets that rejected. Um, but a lot of times, you know, this is speaking of metals, uh, you know, metal is being reprobate, you know, this can no longer be used, this is waste, it can't be used to make jewelry or anything like that, you know, it, it's just waste, and it's, so it's reprobate metal. But the important thing to know is that metal is an inanimate object, it does not have a will as men do, okay, and I think that Stephen Anderson forgets this. So, though the faith, character, or condition of a man may be considered reprobate or rejected and not able to stand the test, for one, this is only the current state, and at any time can become, it can become genuine and right as far as he is living, breathing, repents, and believes in the Lord. So, man has a will. We know that. And so, Stephen Anderson's doctrine, this reprobate doctrine, this bizarre doctrine, it, be, it comes very close to Calvinist teaching, uh, but I can't say that it's exactly Calvinist because Calvinists believe that everything starts with a decree from God, that God um, 
decrees people to salvation and people to damnation, you know, each individual, you know, before the creation of the earth. And so Stephen Anderson says, no, these people had the option, they had a will up until a certain point, and then God uh, takes away their free will or decrees them to hell or whatever. So his teaching is the same as Calvinist that it makes God unjust. But, you know, it's slightly different than what they teach, but it's dangerously close. And a lot of his interpretations of verses are pretty much almost the same interpretations as them. Or, you know, they're, they're dangerous as the Calvinist interpretation is, even though they're slightly different. But, so from here in this teaching, and I'm not going to play these clips, but I've got clips of him saying these things, and I've got quotes from them that are in blue. Uh, but, anyways... It would just take more time for me to play all these, but you can come and check them out. So he starts off with, this is the definition, reprobate means rejected. And so if a person is reprobate, that means they're rejected of the Lord. And, and then he says, you know, they have no chance of salvation. So that's him forcing his own interpretation onto that definition, okay? Uh, so that's not what it means when a person is reprobate. It doesn't mean that they cannot repent, okay? And so... Now he goes on to a reprobate word study. He looks at all the verses, you know, or most of the verses that have the word reprobate, and he pretty much just interjects his definition of, you know, what reprobate means into each of these verses. So he tries to use these as proof texts, but he's really doing, you know, eisegesis. He's putting his own definition into each one of these, and they don't defend what he teaches. But let's look at the first one, Jeremiah chapter 6, verse 30. It says, Reprobate silver shall men call them, because the Lord hath rejected them. So he'll say here, it says the Lord hath rejected them. And if the Lord rejects them, you know, they're reprobates. And if the Lord rejects them, then they have no chance of salvation. So I got some different commentaries and things uh, to try to explain things. So I put, For the Lord hath rejected them, Jews, so we're speaking of a nation, for one, from being his people. He rejected the Jews from being his people and therefore cast them out of their own land and caused them to go into captivity. So that's what this whole passage is talking about. This isn't talking about eternal salvation or anything like that. This is talking about the Jews. This is in Jeremiah, chapter 6, verse 30. We're talking about the Jews being put into captivity, basically the sum of it. So the context has nothing to do with eternal salvation, but it has to do with the rejection of a nation. Still yet, they could repent and be right with the Lord again, even as a nation. So Jeremiah chapter 18 verse 8 says, If that nation against whom I have pronounced, against whom I have pronounced, turn from their evil, I will repent of the evil that I thought to do unto them. You see, people always have the chance to get right with God. And, um, you know, and, and people as a nation as well. This is a general promise that applies to any nation or any individual. God never removes, overrides, or forces a person's will. And so that's basically what, what Stephen Anderson says with this reprobate doctrine, that God takes away their will, or, you know, God does something to them to where they're not going to. So it makes God unjust, is what it does. It makes God unjust, that's, that's all there is to it. So... It's important to know, though, that Jeremiah 6.30 is speaking of Israel as a nation, and it's just talking about them going into captivity, basically, if you sum that up. And uh, So let's go on to the next one. We go into the New Testament. 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 5, Examine yourselves, whether you be in the faith, prove your own selves, know ye not your own selves, how that Christ is in you, except you be reprobates. Okay, and so this basically sums up to Unless the sentence, after an impartial scrutiny by yourselves or a judge gifted with spiritual discernment, is that there is no tokens of his presence. So know ye not your own selves how that Christ is in you. That means that you're saved, except you're reprobates, except uh, your faith doesn't stand the test and you're not saved. So either, basically, this, this verse here shows that basically either you're saved or you're a reprobate. And so reprobates can become saved. And so I probably should have, I should, should put that in the notes, that this makes that distinction, that you, know, you either are saved or you're a reprobate. Reprobates aren't the special class 
of people like Stephen Anderson tries to make him be. So, except you be reprobates, the word rendered reprobates means properly not approved, rejected, that which will not stand the trial. It is probably, it is properly applicable to metals as denoting that they will not bear the test to which they are subjected, but are found to be based or, or adulterated. The sense here is that they might know that they were Christians unless their religion was base, false, adulterated, or such as would not bear the test. There is no allusion here to the sense which is sometimes given to the word reprobate of being cast off or abandoned by God or doomed to him to eternal ruin in accordance with an eternal purpose. The simple idea is that they might know they were Christians unless their religion was such as would not stand the test or was worthless. So either they're Christians or they're not. So all lost people could be considered as reprobates. And, uh, you know, and so this is pretty much refuting Calvinism and Stephen Anderson's teaching, even though they're slightly different. You know, they're both wrong. And so let's go to, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 7 and 8, ever learning, never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Now, as James and Jambres withstood Moses, so do also resist the truth. Men of corrupt minds reprobate concerning the faith. And so Stephen Anderson says, what does it mean to not be able to come to the knowledge of the truth? It means you can't. You cannot come to the knowledge of the truth. Why? Because you've been rejected. And so, again, this is kind of dangerously close to Calvinism, but Calvinism would say they can't come to the truth because God decreed it that they couldn't. And so Stephen Anderson says they can't because they've gone to this point to where God, um, you know, takes away their free will or whatever. But that's not the truth. Why are they never able to come to the knowledge of the truth? Because they have not the right motive because they apply to false teachers of their own free will. Never able because they are never willing. Because if they were willing, then they could believe and repent and turn to the Lord and be saved. God is always willing. Second Peter chapter 3, verse 9. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to us were not willing that any should perish, but that all men should come to repentance. Anderson's interpretation would make Second Peter Chapter 3, verse 9, a lie. According to him, God is willing that some perish. And so, Second Peter chapter 3, verse 9 is a great verse to refute Calvinism. It also refutes Stephen Anderson. He's saying that God does will people to go to hell. That he makes it impossible for them to be saved at a point. It makes God unjust. Titus chapter 1, verse 10 through 16. For there are many unruly and vain talkers and deceivers, especially they of the circumcision whose mouths must be stopped, who subvert whole houses, teaching things which they ought not for filthy lucre's sake. One of themselves, even a prophet of their own, said, The Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, slow bellies. This witness is true. Wherefore, rebuke them sharply, that they may be sound in the faith, not giving heed to Jewish fables, but commandments of men that turn from the truth. Unto the pure all things are pure, but unto them that are defiled and unbelieving is nothing pure. But even their mind is... Even their mind and conscience is defiled. They profess that they know God, but in works they deny him. Being abominable and disobedient and unto every good work reprobate. It means here that in reference to everything that was good, their conduct was such that it could not be approved or deserved disapprobation. Nothing is mentioned or even hinted at of that these people could no longer repent and get right with the Lord. Unbelievers are spoken of, and unbelievers can become believers through faith and, and repentance unto Jesus Christ at any time, as long as they are still living. So, you know, but unto them that are defiled and unbelieving, nothing is pure. Speaking of unbelievers, okay? So yes, unbelievers can become believers. Again, Stephen Anderson's twist on this whole reprobate thing, it's not taught here. It hasn't been taught anywhere. Reprobates cannot believe. Again, this is another Calvinist type passage. John chapter 12, verse 37 through 40. So this is pretty alarming when I start hearing stuff like this. 
But though he had done so many miracles before them, yet they believed not on him, that the saying of Isaiah the prophet might be fulfilled, which he spake, Lord, who hath believed our report, and to whom hath the arm of the Lord been revealed? Therefore they could not believe, they could not believe, because Isaiah said again, He hath blinded their eyes and hardened their heart, that they should not see with their eyes, nor understand with their heart, and be converted, and I should heal them. And so I think when someone comes at Stephen Anderson with Second Peter chapter 3, verse 9, I think it was that the Lord is not willing that any should perish. Stephen Anderson says, yes, he is willing that they should perish. He made it to where they can't believe. He blinded their eyes. He hardened their heart. And the Calvinists will use the same passage. But a very important thing to know is, let's look at the parallel text. The parallel passages, the Jews are spoken of as shutting their own eyes. What? Matthew chapter 13, 14 and 15, speaking of the prophecy of Isaiah, the same passage, the same time is being spoken of basically, but this time we see that their eyes, they have closed. Well, why didn't Stephen Anderson use this passage to prove his point? Because it doesn't. Okay. Acts chapter 28, verse 25 through 27, speaking of the same thing. Their eyes, they closed close their own eyes. So the Jews, as a nation, were hardened by God indirectly, as it is said how that prison hardens a criminal. And so, first of all, again, we're speaking of Jews as a nation. Here's a similar thing spoken of in Romans chapter 8, or 11, verses 7 and 8. What then Israel, as a nation, hath not obtained that which he seeketh for, but the election hath obtained it, and the rest were blinded, according as it is written, God hath given them the spirit of slumber, eyes that they should not see, and ears that they should not hear, unto this day. Speaking of Israel as a nation. They willingly chose to reject God's message. So it could be said that God, through his message, hardened them. Yet it was truly their personal choice to react in such a way. The hardening was temporary also. In Romans chapter 11, verse 25, For I would not, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery, lest ye should be wise in your own conceits, that blindness in part has happened to Israel, until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. So, um, you know, always look, see if in the Gospels, if, they're, if the account is spoken of in the other Gospels, um, and compare them. And, uh, you know, we got this spoken of in Acts as well, but, so, you know, the same thing is with Pharaoh, that, that, you know, God hardened Pharaoh's heart, and then it says Pharaoh hardened his own heart. So, the Bible teaches free will, and, um, you have to reconcile those things. You know, so in what sense could it be said that God hardened his heart? Well, you know, God's message, telling him to repent, and he chose not to, so really... You know, it's it's the individual's choice themselves that, you know, their hardening their heart hardening is a consequence of their own actions, of their own free will decisions, and so this doesn't teach anything like Stephen Anderson wants it to. He says they can't believe because God rejected them. He pretty much you know took away their free will, and uh, he he damned them, and that makes God unjust. That makes God unjust. That makes God unjust. That makes God unjust. So God gives people a reprobate mind. And now here we got Romans, which he goes over quite a bit. But I, I break it down. It's Romans chapter 1, starting at verse 20. Romans chapter 1, verse 20 and 21. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse, because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. And so, it says their foolish heart was darkened, and Stephen Anderson says, who darkened their heart? Uh, well, he's reading that into the text. He's understanding it the way that he wants it to be understood. But that's not the way it's meant to be understood. They darkened their own hearts. It was a natural consequence from their continued rejection of God. Okay, Their foolish heart was darkened. That was a consequence of their rejection of God. 
so it's not an act of God, um, you know, darkening their heart because he wishes evil on them or something. Um, that would make God unjust. Romans chapter 1, verse 22 through 25. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools and changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image like to corruptible man, into birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things. Wherefore, God gave them up to uncleanness through the lusts of their own heart to dishonor their own bodies between themselves who changed the truth of God into a lie and worshiped and served the creature more than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. And we're going to start getting into the homosexual stuff, how he ties this all in together. And uh, so just saying that. But God gave them up. God gave them up to uncleanness. And so, again, you know, Stephen Anderson twists this to where God rejected them. They can no longer repent. They can no longer believe. What this means is that God abandoned them or he ceased to restrain them and suffered them to act out their own sentiments and to manifest them in their life. This does not imply that he exerted any positive influence in inducing them to sin any more than if we should seek by argument and entreaty to restrain a headstrong youth, and when neither would prevail, should leave him to act out his own propensities and to go as he chose to ruin. It is implied in this, that one, the tendency of man was to, was to these sins. The tendency of man was to these sins. Number two, that the tendency of idolatry was to promote them and number three, that all that was needful in order that people should commit them was for God to leave them, him to follow the devices and desires of his own heart. Look at Psalm 81, verse 12, and 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 10, and 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 12. So this is just saying that, you know, uh, basically, you know, men left to their own devices, they get more wicked and wicked. Uh, the unbelieving. So let's look at Romans chapter 1, verse 26 through 28. For this cause God gave them up to vile affections, for even their women did change the natural of use and the natural use into that which is against nature. And likewise also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in lust one toward another. Men work men with men working that which is unseemly and receiving in themselves that recompense of their error which was meet. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient. Stephen Anderson says he gave them over to vile affections. He gave them over to do those things. What are those things? Men with men, working that which is unseemly, women with women. Now I put, if you continue to read the chapter, you notice God gives lost men over to do all unrighteousness, all manner of sins, not necessarily including homosexual acts or any other specific sins for each and every individual, simply that men become more wicked and sinful in many different ways, living life that is as pleasing to themselves and not concerned about the righteousness of God or his forgiveness in any way. Romans chapter 1, verse 29 through 32, we continue, it says, Being filled with all unrighteousness. Now here's a whole list of sins. Fornication, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, debate, deceit, malignity, whisperers, backbiters, haters of God, despiteful, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, without understanding, covenant breakers, without natural affection, implacable, unmerciful, who knowing the judgment of God, that they which commit such things are worthy of death, not only do the same, but have pleasure in them. So he tries to make this thing like it's all about homosexuality, and it's not. It's just one of the things that's mentioned. And he tries to make the reprobate seem like it's some kind of special class of person who God uh, removes or forces their will, which makes God unjust. Reprobate is not some kind of special class of lost person. It's not all about homosexuality. It's just wicked men becoming more sinful uh, from rejecting God. And so now he says that the child of the devil cannot become a child of God. He says, once you're a child of God, how long are you a child of God for? Well, guess what? Once you're a child of the devil, guess how long you're a child of the devil for? Forever. And I said chapter and verse because there's nowhere in the Bible that teaches that. There's nowhere in the Bible that teaches that a child of the devil is always a child of the devil and never has a chance to repent or the capability to repent, or to believe. And so he mentions child of the devil. So I list some of the things that he mentioned, just kind of group them all together. Child of the devil, 
two for twofold more the child of hell, twice dead. He says these are all pictures of a reprobate who can no longer repent. And I said, nowhere in scripture is it taught that a child of the devil or a child of hell or a child of disobedience or a child of wrath, etc., or that anyone thought of as twice dead, metaphorically, is unable to become a child of God and must remain in that state forever. In fact, scripture tells us that by nature we are all children of wrath, and children of wrath have and can become children of God. Ephesians chapter 2 verse 3 says, Among whom also we all had our conversation in times past in the lusts of, of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. But now they are children of God. So, you know, I don't know why people would go along with this. <laughs> All homosexuals are bisexual. And this is really interesting. I was really surprised when he starts getting into this stuff. Like, man, it's just so off. But let's look at Leviticus chapter 20, verse 13. It says, If a man also lie with mankind as he lieth with a woman, both of them have committed an abomination. They shall surely be put to death. Their blood shall be upon him, them. So now he starts getting into these arguments where he's saying that, you know, homosexuals are reprobates and homosexuals are always bisexual they go with women and they go with men and so he starts twisting these things to, to try and prove that so it says if a man also lie with mankind he lieth with a woman as he lieth with a woman so what he tries to say is that well this means that a man has to lie with a woman and with a man but I want to point out that the also in this verse it means, also, if a man does this, he shall be put to death. Not if a man sleep with a woman and also with men. Okay. Notice the pattern for the preceding verses. Leviticus chapter 20, verse 11. And the man that lieth with his father's wife, dot, 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 both of them shall be surely put to death. Leviticus chapter 20, verse 12. And if a man lie with his daughter-in-law, dot, 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 both of them shall be put to death. Leviticus 20.13, And if a man also lie with mankind, dot, 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 they shall surely be put to death. So, the as he lieth with a woman is, is so there are no doubts as to what a man lying with mankind means. It means of a sexual nature. Okay, so if a man also, if a man also commits this sin as if he sleeps with his father's wife or if he sleeps with his daughter-in-law, well, if he sleeps with mankind, then he shall also be put to death, okay? If he lies with mankind. What do you mean, lies with mankind? As he lieth with a woman, okay, in a sexual nature. So, it, this is just really bizarre. I've never heard anybody ever else teach this. Um, how he can just take this word also and try to twist it to make, to make, to make this verse mean something totally different. This is just, uh, he's totally... A novice, I guess. I don't know how you would even come up with that silly nonsense. Let's look at Genesis chapter 9, verse 20 through 22. And Noah began to be an husbandman, and he planted a vineyard, and he drank of wine, and was drunk, and was uncovered within his tent. And Ham, the father of Canaan, saw the nakedness of his father, and told his two brethren without. So Ham, the father of Canaan, saw the nakedness of his father. And so, Anderson says, if we go back to the story in Genesis chapter 9, where we see Ham, the Bible doesn't give us the details, but he looked upon his father's nakedness, which is often uncovering the nakedness, as the euphemism in the Bible, sort of like to lie with, to know them, to uncover their nakedness, some perverted act here. So, first of all, it doesn't say uncovered his nakedness. It says he saw the nakedness of his father. It says that Noah was uncovered within his tent. It doesn't say that Ham uncovered the nakedness of his father. It just says that he saw his father. Noah was naked in the tent. Ham saw that he was naked. Okay, and he told his brothers. So Genesis chapter 9 verse 22 says, Ham saw the nakedness of his father. Although Ham had unrighteous pleasure in seeing his father's nakedness, nothing more than looking upon unrighteously is implied. He's trying to say that Ham had sex with Noah or something like that. That's not what this verse says. It's completely bizarre that he comes to this conclusion. 
But again, he's trying to prove that homosexuals are bisexual because Ham had a wife later on and kids. And so he says, well, see, he did this with Noah, and he also got with women, so homosexuals are bisexuals. This is just crazy. You know, this isn't what this verse teaches. Okay, you know, he saw his father with unrighteous lust or something, and he got off on it, but he didn't do a sexual act with Noah. It's just crazy. Stephen Anderson says, Can you leave the natural use of a woman if you've never been with a woman? Because Romans chapter 1 verse 27 says, And likewise also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in lust toward one another, men with men, working that which is unseemly, and receiving themselves that recompense of that error which is meet. Anyways, the men, leaving the natural use of the woman. Can you leave the natural use of the woman if you've never been with the woman? Again, he's trying to make this argument that homosexuals are bisexuals. They always go with women and men. Very bizarre. So let me explain this. Men leaving the natural use of the woman. These men forsook a general notion of what is natural. Men being with women. Okay? And, and were with men instead. It does not mean that these men slept with women and men. Could very well be that they have never slept with a woman at all and only slept with men. Okay, there are plenty of homosexuals who I'm sure who have never had sex with the opposite sex, but they have had sex with the same sex. Okay, so, I mean, it's obvious. That's just the way things are sometimes for these homosexuals. But Stephen Anderson says, nope, they're always, they're always bisexual. So this is just, again, bizarre. But let me help you understand this. Men leaving the natural use of the woman. It means these men forsook a general notion of what is natural. Men being with women. Okay, naturally men are supposed to be with women. These men, however, were with men. That's all there is to it. Okay, Anderson makes the argument that to leave something, you, have, you must have been a partaker in it. The sense here is that these men forsook what is thought to be the natural order for all mankind. Men with women, women with men, which included them. Okay, so let's continue on. The Lord prevents people from believing so he can destroy them. Now this is one of those passages because of the King James English. I can see how people could very easily get tripped up on this. Uh, but, you know, I have to tell you how it's to be interpreted, and you're either going to take it or you're not. But you have to take all the context of the entire scripture into consideration. And what Stephen Anderson teaches uh, goes against scripture. So, 1 Samuel chapter 2, verse 12 says, Now the sons of Eli were the sons of Belial. They knew not the Lord. So here he says, you know, they were sons of Belial, they were sons of the devil. They knew not the Lord because they were reprobates. And uh, let's continue on. First Samuel chapter 2, verse 22 through 25. Now Eli was very old and heard all that his sons did unto all Israel, and how they lay with the women that assembled at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. And he said unto them, Why do ye such things? For I hear of your evil dealings by all this people. Nay, my sons, for it is not no it is no good report that I hear. You make the Lord's people transgress. If one man sin against another, the judge shall judge him. The judge shall judge him. But if a man sin against the Lord, who shall entreat for him? Notwithstanding, they hearken not unto the voice of their father, because the Lord would slay them. So he's, he says that this means that the sons of Eli did not listen to the message of the Lord or to their father to repent. They didn't they didn't repent because the Lord wanted to slay them. So the Lord prevented them from believing. He, re, he prevented them from repenting so that he could destroy them. That makes God unjust. But the English here, it could be hard to see it any other way. It says, notwithstanding, they hearken not unto the voice of their father, because the Lord would slay them. So it makes you think that this means that the reason why they didn't listen to their father is because God wanted to kill them. 
but we know that that makes God unjust. That can't be what this means. So this should be understood as because so, or because of this, the Lord would slay them. So notwithstanding, they hearken not unto the voice of their father, and because of this, the Lord would slay them. And that makes perfect sense. That goes along with all the context of the rest of Scripture. But they would not hearken, etc. Therefore, God purposed to destroy them. It was not God's preordination, but their own willful and impotent disobedience, which was the cause of their destruction. Anderson's interpretation of this passage would make God to be unjust and put God to blame for the sins of Eli's sons. So, now he goes to abusers of themselves with mankind does not mean homosexuals. And this is a long clip because he just kind of goes on a rant. And I just, I didn't even know where to dissect this. So I, just re I let it record for like 20 minutes to the end of his teaching, basically. So, he says, abusers of themselves with mankind does not mean homosexuals. And so, this is a passage that refutes, again, his teaching that, you know, homosexuals are beyond repentance. They can no longer repent. And so, we see where, basically, homosexuals are spoken of that, that some of the members of the church were previously homosexuals, but they've been washed, they've been saved. And so, it directly refutes his teaching. So, he has to come up with something to twist this and it's just crazy to see the loops that he goes through here. But 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 9 through 11, Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners, shall inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you, but ye are washed, and ye, but ye are sanctified, but ye are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus, and by the Spirit of our God. The previous words, fornicators and adulterers, would apply to a male who has intercourse. This must specifically refer to males who have intercourse with other males. Okay. Um, the abusers of themselves with mankind. So, fornicators and adulterers, males who have intercourse, and then abusers of themselves with mankind, must be males who have intercourse with other males. Now, i got a lot of quotes from Stephen Anderson here, all these loops he tries to go through. There are different theories about what this could be referring to. And so, he goes, he reads 1 Corinthians 6, 18. It says, Flee fornication, every sin that a man doeth is without the body, but he that committeth fornication sinneth against his own body. He says, Does that sound like defiling yourself with mankind or abusing yourself with mankind? Just committing fornication? Well, fornication was already mentioned, so why would it mention it again? Anyways, what is this? First Timothy chapter 1, verse 10. For whoremongers, them that defile themselves with mankind, for men stealers, for liars, for perjured persons, and if there be any other thing that is contrary to sound doctrine. So again, we see them that defile themselves with mankind spoken of here. Stephen Harrison says, I think one very likely meaning to this could be referring to, it says abusers of themselves with mankind, could be that this is like the female equivalent of a whoremonger. No, the female equivalent of a whoremonger is a whore. Okay? And so, again, now he says another theory that has been put forth is that those who abuse themselves with mankind could be those who have committed some kind of an act with other men but they are not a homo because they are not like in Romans 1 burning in lust one towards another. They don't desire that, but maybe they were forced into that. And I didn't say anything about this. Maybe nothing really needs to be said about this. It's just so stupid that you would come up with that. And then he says, I can prove to you right now that no one in the Corinth church used to be a sodomite. He says, God could have just put here sodomites. It's not like he didn't know that word. And I said, just as he could have put whores or harlots, had Anderson's interpretation been true. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13, There hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. Now this is what he thinks proves that no one in Corinth used to be a sodomite. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13, There hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that, that you are able, but will with the temptation, also make a way to escape that you may be able to bear it. And so, 
Anderson's argument is that no temptation that is common to man, he says homosexuality isn't common to all men. He says, you know, I've never had the desire to be with another man. You know, he says, I think it's gross, and all the men in this congregation will say the same, that it's the idea of being with another man is gross, and it's not common. And so that's a false interpretation of this verse. And uh, I had to look into it more to really understand it, and I'm glad that I understand this a little bit better. So what it means when it says common to man is except such as is human. Except such as is human, such as a man can bear. Okay, no temptation, no, no, there hath no temptation taken you, but such as is human. Okay, or but such as a man can bear. Okay, uh, to, par to paraphrase this verse, your temptations, as you know, have not hitherto gone beyond your strength, neither will they, through the faithfulness of God, do so in the future. It is the strength of the temptations that are common to man, and that they are not above man's ability to bear them. It does not mean that temptations are common to man in the sense that all men have been tempted with the same individual particular temptations or sins. Stephen Harrison says, All these things, being tempted to steal, kill, fornicate, etc., are natural. The Bible says they do that which is against nature. Men with men, that's against nature. How did they get that way? Romans chapter 1 verse 26 says, For this cause God gave them up vile affections, for even their women did change the natural use into that which is against nature. And so, not against nature in the sense that any individual may not be tempted to do such things, but against nature that children, nature's end, and posterity is utterly lost by it. It's against the order of nature. So homosexual acts are against the order of nature. It doesn't mean that any lost, sinful person can't be tempted to. So, again, this is all bizarre. He makes God unjust. He tries to make reprobate the special class of sinners. You know, blah, blah, blah. So I went through all that. I hope you learned something. Uh, you know, I want to get started on his other teaching. And uh, I hope you just see how crazy this is. That How he twists these verses and tries to say that, you know, that uh, Ham did some kind of sexual act with his father and whatever else. And now the website's just kind of blanking out. But uh, I'm just going to end it here. You can come and check it out. Leave comments. What do you think? Uh, you know, Like I said, a lot of people can see through this anyways, but you might be interested in how he interprets these different verses. I was, and I learned things. But, you know, there are handfuls of people who do believe this, because they're followers of him, because, you know, he's reaching out to a lot of people, unfortunately. Uh, you know, the only people to really complain about this would probably be his particular followers. But, uh, you know, I've never really read any commentaries or anything with uh, any other interpretation that, that comes to close to his, you know. But he does come close to some Calvinist teachings, so... Anyways, thanks for watching, and God bless.